<clears throat> in this particular case, at, at, the, at the left side, the really big circle here, uh, lands on the word sorcerer, which is a low frequency word and which doesn't have a direct translation in Swedish. So I think the student didn't know what, what sorcerer means and therefore had to process it more. And in many other cases, <clears throat> in this particular case, at, at the left side, the really big circle here, yes, uh, lands on the word sorcerer, yes, which is a low frequency word. Direct translation in Swedish. <laughs> so I think the student didn't know what, what sorcerer means and therefore had to process it more. And in many <laughs> other cases, <clears throat> in this particular case, uh, that's not me speaking. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know where that uh, voice comes from. I would like to leave that and instead talk about factors that affect eye movements during reading that we know about. So, if um, Alexander, do you think you can stop that? <laughs> I'm not sure if it's. Um coming from anyone else uh, could you check if there's some kind of audio signal running on your laptop i would like to leave that and instead talk about factors that affect eye movements during reading that we know about so if um, alexander do you think you can stop that i'm not sure <laughs> if it's um <laughs> coming else. It might be the live feed, so because um, mm. I think the streaming service was just released, it might run parallel in the background with some delay. Right. Yeah, it could be that. Yeah, I, yeah, so I shut it down, so maybe now it will work. Now, um, there have been, a, the study of reading with eye movements have been going on for quite some time and many effects have been replicated. So we know that low frequency uh, leads to longer fixations. So if you show these two sentences, Deb didn't read the chapter when I told her what was in it and Deb didn't read the tabloid when I told her what was in it. Tabloid is a low frequency, chapter is a more high frequency word, which means that the processing of this will take longer. The fixation will be longer. And I think this is true generally. It's not just in reading, it's in scene perception, it's in everything. As soon as we encounter something which takes a little bit more to process, the fixations will be longer. This is one of the most uh, important uses of eye tracking. You can see what is difficult to process. Uh, other things that are uh, have been found again and again is word length. Longer word means uh, fixation will be longer, uh, processing time will be longer. Uh, predictability also affects eye movements. If you can predict from the preceding context, uh, then you will have shorter fixations because it's less effortful to process. Uh, ambiguity in meanings leads to longer fixations because there are several different possibilities to interpret this. And that I think, again, this is true. If we would do the same thing for, or the corresponding thing in uh, source code, we would find uh, effects that we can interpret in a similar way. Uh, then there are maybe differences. Um, people have also Notice that uh, there are individual differences in reading uh, if you show them longer texts. And in particular, one, I think, really nice study by Yuka Hyena from 2002 showed uh, with um, cluster analysis that there were four major types of readers. Uh, the fast linear readers who just go through the text as quickly as possible, but never return. Uh, the slow linear readers who Reinspected sentences locally before moving on. Uh, the non selective readers who looked back at uh, previous sentences. And finally, the best ones, uh, the topic structure processes, who paid close attention to headings 
and key words in the text. And they found that um, this group who structured the reading by what's important in it, they had the best um, working memory capacity. And also afterwards, when they summarized the text, they gave the most accurate text summaries. Yeah, uh, people have also started proofreading, um, which is an entirely different type of activity from, say, reading a novel. Uh, proofreading leads to shorter saccades, which you can expect, uh, longer fixations and gaze duration, because now you're looking for errors. And that's an entirely different thing than trying to comprehend content. Uh, there's a higher probabil probability of regressions of going back in the text. And there's a larger effect on word frequencies. And then they have looked at different types of spelling errors and how likely people are to do that. Uh, generally, the, the conclusion from reading research is that readers adopt fairly sophisticated word processing strategies to accommodate to the demands of the task. Um, I would like to point out that reading is not only done in text. People read other type of media as well. Uh, this is uh, a newspaper and uh, classical paper newspaper and how people read that. And notice uh, that they don't read the text from beginning to end. They start like in this um, on the left side here with the, with the photo. Uh, they read the headline. Uh, look a little bit at the photo, then they read a little bit at the beginning, jump, read a bit, jump, read a bit. And this, I, this is very common. You see it in newspaper reading all the time. Uh, this means that there is one part that is reading in a classical sense, that they are interested in the content. They want to understand the whole sentences and pick up a com composite content from that text. But there is also an element of search in this. They are looking for the information that in this case they find more informative, but say that this was source code instead, then they would look for information that where, the, where there is an error or where there could be information that they need to solve a task. And humans do this. They combine the detailed processing that we see as reading here with search for that information. So this switching between fine processing and search is very common in all kinds of, um, of eye tracking. Um, in reading, it's called scanning. So reading and scanning. So um, I will end with a lot of questions. Um, which I hope the next speaker will be able to address. Namely, how do software experts read code? Do they read like we read text? Uh, probably not like we read novels, I doubt that. Uh, they most likely scan quite a lot. I would expect this. They quickly look for the most informative part and start there, I would expect. Uh, do they look longer at unusual constructions? Probably. I would expect a frequency effect. Uh, does the task affect their reading? I am positive that it does. Uh, task affects eye movements everywhere. So if they are reviewing source code for, for um, say, looking for errors, it will be entirely different from the reading that they do when they develop the code. Uh, are there individual differences? Yeah, I would suspect so. Um, and how can novices learn to read like experts? Can we show the expert gaze pattern and novices can learn from it? It's an important research question. And um, generally, uh, this field of, of reading source code is at the very beginning, I think, compared to reading, which is reading of classical text, which has been going on for like 80 years by now. So we need more eye movement data, we need more projects.
Uh, that was my my talk, and I'll be happy to take questions. If there are no questions in the moment, we can also... Uh, I think I saw some hands raised. Was that, or no, or were they just clapping? No. So we can also oh. make in the end uh, yes, a discussion uh, uh, about eye tracking after the next presentations or after the practical study here virtual in the virtual world. Uh, so I need the right as co-author or co-chair that I can share my screen. Yes, it works. Do you see the Regensburg slide? Yes. Okay. I for, uh, forgot in the beginning that we have an introduction slide. Now you see Regensburg. Northest point of River Danube. And currently we have the fog days. We have no sun but uh, we have a good position to the Bavarian wood. I was yesterday in the Bavarian wood and the temperature was 15 degree higher as in Regensburg. So it was a fine day, but currently we have the typical November weather in Regensburg. Uh, this is the agenda I told you in the beginning. Kenneth Holmquist make an introduction to eye tracking. I give a short, uh, inside. Uh, I prepared two uh, elements. I think I will only give one element to ha have also time for Christian for his contribution. And then we have a starting of the experimental part of the demonstration part. It's three o'clock. This is the plan. And here I can also give the conference a slide set, a short profile of the contributors and our colleague Hans Gruber has given an apology. Yes, okay. Then I take the other slide set and I give uh, a short introduction to our questions in software engineering. Um, we, I call it expertise research in software engineering. And this is a fundamental task. We have also in education to bring novices into the competence field of experts. Sometimes it happens at university. Very often it will appear in the daily work after the university. So competence is something which happens not in the lecture. Competence is a process of time. We can give our best that competences will be achieved. So we uh, take uh, the complete software engineering process in our focus. We started with code reviews in C and C++. This was a, we did a lot of publications about eye tracking and analyzed different aspects in code understanding, in transfer from UML models to code, from requirements. So we have different artifacts and we did analysis. I will focus on code review. Uh, yes, uh, my institute is a laboratory for safe and secure systems. I have a research professorship in Bavaria uh, for software engineering and my aspect is in, in a great, yeah, great dimension, functional safety and IT security. More in technical systems, not commercial or bank systems, technical systems. And I'm uh, also member of the board of the Bavarian IT security cluster. And I also work as member in the MISRA C and C++ guidelines. So we have a close connection to coding standards and I have a lot of research project and networking, the things which are necessary. And my hobby is the Alpine area. I also was in the Himalaya mountains several times, but not on the top, only tracking. No stupid things. <laughs> Good. Uh, I start my discussion if we, if we talk about software engineering, we talk and we, we, we look back, uh, we had 50 years of software engineering uh, 
behind us uh, and uh, we, we take a look back and we know that quality and good processes are a topic. And for understanding later the problems we have with source code, we should keep in mind the perspective of dependability. Dependability is a fundamental principle in both in soft system engineering and in software engineering. And a good colleague of mine, I knew him, Jean-Claude Laprie in Toulouse. We have every two years a conference about safety uh, here in Toulouse. And he did a very good paper where he did a taxonomy of the terms which are covered by dependability. And you see availability, reliability, we know such disciplines cover us with matrix measure, measurements for systems. We have the functional safety, we have the security, we have the confidentiality, integrity. It's a topic, it's both in safety and security and maintainability. This is the focus uh, we have in my research in mind. This covers our, our yeah, leading questions in eye tracking studies. And this paper is very good. I, I can recommend to everybody to use this paper uh, if you work with dependability. And there's a lot of mistake of the terms uh, which are shown here. This paper clarifies all the things. It's very good. And now if we, we have the goal to reduce faults in our systems. And the question is how many faults we have in the systems and what can we do? And there's an old study. This study is from 1997. And this study gives us an overview about design faults in kilo source code lines of codes. Also this is a dimension of errors of latent design faults, which can manifest as error. It's 1000 lines of code. And here you see different maturity models, a very generic one and the one of the avionic industry, you have levels. And if you are in a very good position, you have five faults, five latent faults at 10,000 lines of code. And this is an interesting topic. And it's a lie to say we can build systems with zero defects. I know a lot of industry which do this, but this is not real. We have defects in our systems and we have to have find strategies in software engineering. We have two strategies. We have um, to, one topic is to have a good development process. A lot of software engineering research in the past years goes in this direction. Also the IGL development has an aspect to reduce the uh, faults. And the other aspect is how to handle uh, faults in technical systems. So fault reduction, fault handling, fault discovery, fault recovery, fault prediction. These are topics we have in software engineering and system engineering. And to reduce faults is a strategy. We have technical aspects. I don't make it make now a lecture about functional safety. This is a core messages are how to build such systems, what, what is a uh, functional safety concept and things like this. I don't speak about this, I gave only the numbers. We have such design faults and we have to reduce it. Then I searched and uh, yes, and in science you have to still hope that changes yeah, will be visible. And uh, a factor of thousand will, would be very good if time flows and we have better processes, better technologies, thousand would be very good. And I found um, a paper 2012, it's 15 years later, 15 years later. And what we see is here a comparison of different projects by this authors. Uh, we are in the same order. We have defect density per kilo lines of code. And the mature a process is, the less the number of defects are. This is consistent. And there's also um, comparison of different process models. But here I, I, I have not the fundamental description of the experiments or the projects. I will not make here an argumentation for the right slides. So an essential topic is we have faults in our system and we can find these faults by clear, clear by compiler, by code checker, 
by code review and so the question is how can we improve to find these faults in which role can software engineering with eye tracking have starting this area which faults can happen we have a standard classification scheme of faults which can happen in for example c or c plus plus code we have semantic errors for example we have invalid program logic incorrect results can happen but the syntax of the source code may be valid so but the algorithm is not valid. So this is an error which is not easy to find in general. We have syntax errors. Syntax error will not compile. The compiler will help us. We have design errors. The design is done in the wrong, done in the development, and the program is wrong because the design is wrong. We have style errors, violating coding style rules, which help us for readability. We have lexical errors. During, during the lexical analysis, such errors can happen. We have logical errors, which have an overlap to semantic errors. We have unintended or undesired output because of a bug in a program. And we have compiler errors. So we have to clarify, compiler errors can happen because the compiler will found a systematic fault, which uh, has a syntax error, for example. But here we make the classification that the compiler itself had an error. This can also happen. And here are also strategies in embedded systems project to uh, reduce the probability of a compiler error. If we make an analysis, uh, how this error, uh, yes, can, can be put in this diagram, uh, we see that we have compile time found errors. So we find it compile time by the compiler, by a checker, by a review tool, or we have errors we find very late during dynamic test or not so good at runtime in the field of a system. And there are errors which are easy to find. For example, the lexical errors or the syntactic errors can be found very easily. And we have tendential errors which can be found not so easy. I say hard error. So we can order it and we have process improvement. And in this process improvement, we have the desire that there is a shift from the right to the left side. And also in modern C, we have a development of, um, we call it compile time computing, that the compiler does uh, a lot of checks, for example, in the type system. Modern C is better as C in this point of argumentation. But these are the errors which can happen. So we should keep in mind to reduce errors and to know about the categories. We have a landscape of errors which can happen. And um, the next topic is why we write programs. And uh, so uh, programming language, and this is a very nice definition of the CPP con. This conference is in Denver, but it's here every year but this year it was digital, okay. <laughs> Denver is also very nice because of the mountain area behind. Very nice, very nice. But uh, in 2014 conference, there was a very nice uh, definition. A goal, code is going to live a long time and to be read many times. We choose explicitly to optimize for the reader, not for the writer. This should be a message in our university education to every student to write for the reader, not for the writer. And so there are languages you can, uh, you can make obfuscation. And C and C++ are languages you can make a very good obfuscation that nobody understands in one hour what two, 20 lines of code are doing. And to give this certain assistance, we use coding guideline and we use style guideline. Yes, and why we do eye tracking analysis of code understanding of code quality, code review is essential part of a development process. We do it because the well known and well used programming language C for embedded systems has insecurities, has problems. And the problem starts with the standard. Uh, we have the situation 
that the compiler doesn't do what the programmer expect. The background is, in some aspects, uh, that not all is defined in the C standard. It comes from the time of the beginning of C as it was decided that the compiler manufacturer can make optimization by their competence and something is still open. But uh, the result is that different compilers can have different results. I have a complete lecture about this topic. It's a very, uh, yeah, very risk topic of C. Uh, you need coding guidelines to avoid these problems. The compiler contains error, it's 1.0 and the runtime error, which can happen because overflow, address of pointer, array bound errors, because in C, I have also no check at runtime about limits of arrays. I can navigate in the memory, and this is also a vulnerability for IT security issues. A lot of attacks can be handled by this deficiency of C. Yes, and what we have is a MISRA coding guideline. We have it for C and for C++. I, uh, I traveled regularly to Birmingham where I'm member of this committee. This year we did all in digital conference and MISRA C defines a well-defined subset for good programming in C. The same is for C++ possible. I have a, a few slides later more information and there are a lot of rules. The world is uh, in embedded software engineering so that MISRA C is a worldwide standard for C. It's well accepted in every domain. It's a very good description about C, how to handle C, very exact. And without danger, it reduces the language with parts which I can use. In C++, the world is more different. I give you here an excerpt of C++ coding guidelines. It's a lot. I will say something. I say MISRA C++, probably next year. I'm not sure. We would have published this year, but Corona comes and we have a delay. So as an AutoSAR guideline for C++ 14, and we have also to keep in mind that we have every C years a new C++ standard. So there's also a change. The language is in development. It says it's, it, itself, it has a high dynamic. Very good is a high integrity C++ coding standard. I can recommend. Then it's IPA from Japan. They have a very nice categorization. They make a categorization following the line of non-functional requirements. Typically, coding standards follow the chapter, the chapter titles of uh, learning books. In this guideline, the non-functional requirements are the ordering principle. It's very interesting to have a different ordering prin principle. We have GSF, it's very it's old, 2005. We have the third guidelines with a focus. They are very good and they have, um, Good and bad example. The MISRA guidelines have only bad example and you have asked yourself, what's a good example? So third is very good and actor, very current is a C++ core guideline. It's from the standardization committee and it's well written and very interesting. So we have a, in C++ a very different world of guidelines and standards. And uh, here is the same as in general, general in software engineering, you have to put the things together for your organization, what works. So this is the world uh, of the subject domain of the domain of safe and secure programming. And we take a closer look to MISRA. MISRA has the topics of unspecified behavior, as I told you, the C++, C standard and C++ standard have not defined what happens. We have undefined behavior and implementation specific behavior. And the goal is uh, to avoid the risks behind these unexpected things. I have here a longer text you can read. I told you the things you have here numbers about such issues. And if you take a look in the, I have a diff, uh, similar picture for C. 
if you, uh, for C++, this is a picture for C, you see the ice mountain and you see with the ice mountain, a little piece is uh, on the top of the water. You have things which are easy, which are not so yeah, erroneous. You can make not so much errors in, yeah, in principle, but you can also make errors with four. But you have other topics. You have the question of type safety. You can move different type data types together. You have the array and pointer semantic, which is uh, sometimes not too clear. You have the access to system. You have the undefined behavior, unspecified behavior, dangerous conversions. You have a lot of things. You have side effects, unconditional jumps. You have integral promotion. I say in my lectures, this is a feeling of a data type. So you have things which are very interesting and surprising. You have function pointer, which are not easy. You have the issue of recursion. You have type conversion as a topic, which is not so easy. And Misra C will give you guidance to handle this, uh, not, this topics, which can uh, cause a violation, uh, an error, an insecurity. Misra C will touch this. And now next, next point, we have a look to the normative regulation. I take a look to the norm for the generic norm for functional safety. It's a 61508. And what says a norm? You have different safety integrity level. The safety integrity level is a metric which gives us information how safe a system has to be. Or in the other way spoken, if a cell four systems system has an erroneous situation and hazard or an accident, a lot of people die. If you have a SIL1 uh, system, the damage is less. So if you have C as language, it's not recommended for safety systems. If you have C with a coding, with a coding standard admitted as a subset of the language, it's recommended, it's highly recommended to build a system. Yes, and then I have a slide from the normative regulation. I make a jump about it. It has a few aspects of language. And here you see use of a coding standard is highly recommended. No dynamic variables for SIL4, highly recommended. Limited use of recursion, highly recommended. It's an interesting topic currently in the normative regulation how to handle recursion uh, regarding artificial intelligence. So it's a, also a topic. But I make a jump from this slide because it's an overview of the generic safety norm. The MISRA standard has a lot, a lot more of aspects. Yeah, uh, you can see MISRA C, the issues of unspecified, undefined implementation defined behavior of a coding guideline in the company, and you have uh, the standard of the language. And this is different. This is a message to use MISRA C to use a well defined subset with additional features from a company guideline. And now, in the end, I think I, I will end with a slide to give you an, an idea what we want to do in eye tracking. The following slides uh, would have discussed. Uh, how we use eye tracking for future learn management systems. But because of time, I think I end with the following slide because if we have uh, no conflict in our time arrangement. I give you the model of source code and knowledge. The knowledge is in the mind of the engineer, of the expert. And um, so you see here code, uh, a function which returns a pointer and here's a, 42 is given the variable j and you it's a local variable and you return j to through this interface you see the scope of the brackets and you have a main where you have a pointer variable up to an integer of 8-bit type length and then you make a call to foo and give pj the value and then you return zero and then you have a knowledge model. So you can have the coding guideline, the address of an object. So the coding guideline text sometimes is written uh, like, like a lawyer, 
the right text. So for our students, it's not so easy to understand coding guidelines, uh, but um, it's, they have to learn to handle the such elements in software engineering. The address of an object with automatic storage shall not be assigned to another object that may persist after the first object has ceased to exist. Um, also, don't give a temporary variable to a other object variable when uh, this other variable uh, lives longer than the first variable. So you can also say it in another way around, but this text is very compact and it gives a message and behind object, a variable is given. So and then you have to fit the content of the rule to given parts in the program. You see lifetime as a temporary object has this lifetime and you have to build uh, your knowledge model. And what we want to see is now, yeah, I, I gave you five aspects, five areas of interest in this code. So this is a geometric part. It's for example, the rectangle area. And I want to analyze where is the focus as a function of time. We want to find patterns, patterns that we have a focus starting. Uh, okay, it's, it's not all given. Also the function name is red, but I want to focus on the coding guideline rule and we want to say which patterns of attention will happen. So this is our general idea to uh, make an analysis about patterns which can happen in the understanding of code. The second, the relation to coding guideline rules. And third, and here I stop, I have slides, but I stop. Third, we want to build adaptive systems, which gives us, which give us feedback. If I have not seen a typical element, what to do in the review and the code reading and that we can avoid errors, uh, uh, faults, which can ha error, happen as error later. So that we enlarge the code quality. This is our goal, better understanding of implementing of assistance in review process of understanding of coding guidelines. Okay. Good. Is there a question? No. Then when no questions, then I give the task to Christian Wolf. So I will uh, add some remarks on using eye tracking methodology in software engineering and software engineering education. And for that reason, of course, I prepared some slides and just looking where the right button is. So hopefully you now see again the Regensburg slide to start with and I just have to check whether my presenter is connected. Yeah, right. So I'm starting from the motivation for empirical software engineering. This is a, an old quote, but it's still true. Software engineering is still not very old and it still has not a regular basis in empirical methodology, you could argue, because it's special, because we have large projects and we cannot, uh, it's often hard to do comparative research because uh, the effort is so big, but still people have recognized that there is a need to do more empirical research in software engineering in general. And what we are proposing, of course, is focusing on uh, eye tracking, using eye tra the use of eye trackers and eye tracking methodology as a specific research evidence. This is a famous essay by Barbara Kitchenham and colleagues. Uh, who said that uh, like in other disciplines like medicine or educational science, also software engineering should follow the track going into the direction of evidence-based uh, uh, methods, uh, which as they call it, uh, should have the goal 
that we have the means by which current best evidence from research can be integrated with practical experience and human values in the decision making process regarding the development and maintenance of software. That's directed to software engineering in general, but we also can do it more focused. We have that strong influence from what has happened in uh, educational research, studies like PSAR and TIMS and many others have shown that evidence-based evaluation of education is important and we can do the same for software engineering. Uh, and I would argue that we go from evidence-based software engineering to evidence-based software engineering education. I would say that's more or less a field with common methodology because when we look closer at it, what does it mean, sorry, what does it mean to do empirical research in software engineering? It means that we have this full spectrum of empirical research methods. We have controlled experiments and when we come to think of eye tracking, that's the first thing we come to think of, that we uh, design uh, experiments uh, according to all rules of statistics and test methodology. And we use eye trackers uh, for uh, getting to know how people look at code, how they read it, how they use it in modeling. But at the same time, we also can use eye trackers for other for other methodology in software engineering, for example, case study methodology uh, has a strong influence because in many cases uh, you cannot do experimental research because you don't have the data or because it would mean uh, too high effort. So you do, for example, uh, case studies and you can also do them uh, using eye tracking, I would argue. At the same time, we have all the tough or wicked problems of software engineering education, learning to program, learning to understand the basic concepts of object orientation, finding and evaluating requirements, mapping from requirements to design, doing traceability uh, through the whole engineering process, dealing with openness that we don't have a single solution for a given problem, uh, having to learn what good quality in software means and so on and so forth. And my argument is that you can find uh, possible applications of eye tracking technology in all these fields. And there's a very nice uh, paper. Oh, there's something, something in the chat, sorry. Oh, why don't I see it? Oh, you see the presenter. Ah, I shared the wrong screen. Uh, thank you very much, I'm sorry. Let me just uh, switch that uh, for a second. Mm -hmm. Wrong screen, I'll take that one. That may be better. Okay, now it's the right one. Okay, sorry, sorry for that. Uh, there's a very nice paper published uh, five years ago, uh, a review paper uh, for eye tracking in software engineering. And they did a comprehensive search of all the studies uh, which had been published so far. And they classified according to what aspect uh, has been researched, whether it's model comprehension or code comprehension or debugging or collaborative interaction or traceability. And I would argue that's interesting because it more or less shows us that eye tracking research can start right at the point where Kenneth introduced reading research because the early stages of software engineering are more or less text, not code, but text. If you look at structured requirements in doors or some other requirements tool, you have to deal with text. So you can actually, just as Kenneth showed us, uh, start with uh, so-called, uh, or you could argue the traditional way of using eye trackers for uh, understanding how people read text. But then of course we, all, we have all the different visual and textual artifacts in the software engineering process. You have visual models. Most studies have been looking at UML diagrams, which is quite natural. Of course, we have code in the different languages. And then in the later uh, stages of implementation and testing, uh, we also have studies where people have looked at uh, 
debugging behavior, people have looked at eye tracking in collaborative interaction, and they also have looked at traceability. Traceability, of course, is more complex because it refers to the knowledge transfer from early requirements to design, to specification, to code, and so on and so forth. So this is certainly is methodically, uh, methodolo no, method-wise more challenging, I would argue. And what has been measured, uh, the major uh, measurement metrics are visual effort and efficiency on the one hand, and of course, gaze behavior. And again, from the same, uh, from the same study, I've taken this nice diagram where you can see uh, what kind of language uh, the study addressed. You see it's mostly Java. I think they had something like uh, 37 papers so far in 2015. And Java is the clear leader as far as code comprehension is concerned. And if we look at model comprehension, there's just one, uh, one business uh, process modeling notation paper, uh, entity relationship diagrams, but seven on UML. So Java and UML appear to be the most uh, frequent uh, types of study. And if you look at the histogram, uh, on this slide, you see the number of our participants in the studies. So uh, mostly we have something around 20, because I would argue that uh, reasonable statistics starts around there, and only few studies really reaching more impressive numbers, which is quite reasonable because eye tracking research uh, takes a lot of effort and having 170 people running a eye tracking experiment, of course, takes a long time. And this is, of course, one of the points we would like to make when we think of our eye tracking lab and classroom, that we have the opportunity of uh, reaching higher numbers in our experiments. Maybe we haven't done uh, so, so far, but at least this infrastructure allows for a more time efficient testing of higher numbers of participants. If we look more closely what people have done, there are many examples uh, for us, uh, understanding programming as some kind of information behavior is very interesting because information behavior is one of the major research fields in our institute where we work together with information scientists but also uh, people from media uh, studies and uh, the quote uh, which was given earlier today uh, that google writes their code guidelines so that we should be aware of the reader not of the writer points in that direction as well because as uh, Empirical work tells us that most of the time when people develop software, they are reading and uh, a large degree of what they are reading is not their own code. They also read their own code, of course, in order to know how to proceed with development, but they read code of others. And that's of course, information behavior. I read code in order to understand what a certain piece of a program does. And in many cases, it's uh, my task is to understand and read what others have written. So uh, we see programming as part of information behavior and the, the, mention, the studies mentioned here are just giving uh, some hints on what, has, on what has been done so far. For example, a uh, study by Wano from 2006, they looked at the individual performance uh, of people uh, reading source code uh, by using an eye tracker or Buzian, they also looked at the reading uh, order when people uh, do code reading and they try to answer some of the question uh, questions Kenneth has raised earlier today. We have a quite recent study on uh, code summarization where they uh, used an eye tracker in order to find out what points are important to the reader and what maybe not as important. Another study by our colleagues, by uh, Jürgen Mottok and uh, uh, Mr. Hauser from this year also addressed the problem of how to do code reviews. And just to finish with a known uh, example, we did a very small study uh, three years ago 
where we want to, uh, wanted to find out whether there are gender related differences in eye tracking behavior. So we did an experiment in our introductory class where people had to do some object oriented programming with the bouncer example, which is quite famous because it was devised in America as an introductory valid way of uh, teaching uh, programming. And in this case, actually, uh, the results were not very impressive because actually we found no gender differences, but this is an interesting fact uh, on its own. And uh, summing up, uh, we also have, let's say, something around 50 or more studies which already have used uh, eye tracking for learning more about software engineering processes. They look at all the stages, they look at all relevant artifacts in the software engineering process, text, code, models, diagrams. And uh, this is where we start uh, with uh, our eye tracking classroom and lab, where our challenges are that we need an, uh, a good software infrastructure for not uh, doing one experiment at a time. That's the specific advantage of this eye tracking classroom that we can have multi-person experiments. And at the same time, we also want to use it not just at looking at more people uh, doing software engineering tasks and measuring their eye movements. We also want to use it for novel methods where we actually uh, learn more about collaborative processes. And Jürgen Mottok has mentioned that in the long run, we also want to uh, use eye trackers in a more active role uh, when we uh, want to design adaptive systems where the eye tracking information is immediately processed and uh, systems uh, will be able to give better feedback to the people uh, doing their software engineering tasks. So this is a just very brief look on what's happening in eye tracking and software engineering and software engineering education research. And now I would like uh, to hand over to the practical part of our tutorial to the eye tracking classroom uh, team who uh, will give you a short tour uh, and will introduce our infrastructure there. Thank you very much so far. And of course, if, uh, if there are any questions immediately, we can uh, discuss now or we will have the final discussion in the end. So also our message is if you have seen the laboratory and uh, you know, you, we can also discuss about, uh, for example, European research proposals we can uh, perform together. So we are still open for cooperation, Christian, or? Of course. Yes, also for European projects could be very interesting for us. Okay, but if there's no question, probably after the practical part. Florian, are you, uh, Alexander, who is doing the practical part? Ah, I bring in classroom, it's Florian. Okay, hello, my name is Florian Hauser. I'm here at the Regensburg uh, Louder, bitte. Uh, eye tracking classroom with my colleagues Vanessa. You can't see her right now, but she will act as one of our participants today. So we would like to show you a short live experiment after our guided tour through the laboratory and with my colleague Stefan, who is doing most of the technical part here today. So I would just like to start with a short presentation of a lab. As you can see behind me here, you can see a lot of computers and you can see the small devices attached to it. That's all what the eye tracker is. So it's rather small in this case. As Kenneth has mentioned it before, this is a Toby um, Spectrum Pro 600 Hertz version. So it is able to do recordings with 600 Hertz per second. So you can really get 600 frames of a moving eye each second, which is actually relative fast for eye trackers. So it's also able for um, not only for software engineering stuff, but also for neurological stuff. So for example, just to see, okay, 
does a participant recognize that there was a stimuli or something like this? So it's actually rather fast, but which is more important for us is in this case, it's also very accurate. So as Professor Wolf has mentioned in his presentation, we have done a lot of code reading studies and that is obviously the tool of choice for us. So it's rather accurate. And as far as I can say it from my studies, it's decent enough but I can really use it to also see, are we focusing on single characters or some signs in the code? So for our purposes, they are very um, accurate. So here in this lab, as you can see, there are many of them. So here we have two rooms. Here in this room, we have built up um, 11 eye trackers. Um, what is interesting about the laboratory is that you can use them in a simultaneous way. So you can not only do data collection with a single participant you can also do it but you can also use all of these eye trackers built up here um, simultaneously in a way that you can speed up your data collections so you can control all of them from one central um, pc and run your experiment from this so you can track 11 participants at a time we have three more additional eye trackers we can use for some extra purposes maybe if you have a larger study or you can also take them out in the field and do some field data collections. So they are also very uh, transportable for our reasons. Okay, well, right now due to the crisis, we cannot really do big studies. So we are also a bit slowed down like probably everyone, but well, we all hope in future that it's going well. So what we also have here at the lab, which might also be interesting for you, are these. I guess you might probably know them. We have also some modified HTC Wives. So these are VR glasses you can use for, for example, gaming studies or also for scene perceptions. They are also modified and are having eye trackers. Um, so you can, for example, use a 3D video and show it to your participant. And they can really move their head around and see what happens around them. So we did some just some presentation stuff, but not really studies so far. We hope to do some in the future, but they are also something, I would say rather unique for this lab because they are not available for such a long time. And we are in a good position to have two of them here. Okay, so I think our next step would be that we can do a short experiment with Vanessa. Are there any questions so far regarding the classroom setup? Stefan? Okay, if there are no questions, then I would like to introduce Vanessa to you. Just come to me. Vanessa is a PhD student at Professor Gruber's chair. So he's also a professor who was today unfortunately missing because he I think he's teaching today, doesn't so. he? Yes, uh, quite a lot of stuff. I think the term has just started right now. So yeah. Okay. So um Vanessa will act as a participant for our study today. We have just prepared a very short study, which I just call web search. And it should, it's her task to do just some review and look up when the University of Regensburg was founded and when the OTH was founded. Okay, so we will start with the experiment. Stefan, are you here on the seat first? So our first step is to place our participants. So in this case, it's not ideal because we have just some office chairs here and it's not ideal. So ideally, it would be great if they are sitting stable and cannot move around, but we really want to make sure that your participant is instructed to sit as still as possible and doesn't move around during the experiment. Now I start our experimental tool, which is um, also made by Toby. It's just the Toby ProLab app. And where is Okay, here is our web search, which we have already prepared before our workshop. Here it is. And when we can start, the first step of the experiment is always to do a proper calibration of our participant. So in this case, we just have OK, 
okay, when I will add a new participant. In this case, it's participant T2. Same over the PC here, vice chair. Okay. When is the cancelled right now? Normally, we are just flipping around one of the second screens, but for today with a recording, it's easier for us to do it in this way. Okay, then I start the recording. And there is an optimal tracking distance for the eye tracker. So now we can start with placing her. So as long as we are here in the green um, area, everything is fine. In this case, it's a bit high, so I will just adjust the eye tracker slightly and maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay, and maybe just push it a bit more closer to her, just a bit. Okay, in the next step I'll start the calibration and then you will see some points Vanessa has to look at. Okay. a look at the calibration. So for code reading study, this would not be ideal. So the degree also gives us the accuracy of the eye tracker. So normally on the perfect conditions, the spectrum can run with an accuracy of 0 0.1 or maybe 0.2 degrees. But for the study we are doing right now, we can use this calibration. If you are checking all the crosses here, you can also see where some uh, mistakes have happened and well, for example, I can demonstrate it right now. This one has a rather bad calibration and it's okay, that's okay, also okay. So it's just the one in the right upper corner and maybe this one. So I can also just recalibrate these um, calibration issues. So, uh, Florian, the eye tracking them. bildschirm, the sieht man sehr it. dunkel. Kannst du you das see it once again. Okay. Just these two. Mm -hmm. Oh, and this is a validation what she sees now. So the prolet version always adds a validation of your calibration. Okay, with this one we have a problem. And also with this one, but we right now have an overall good calibration, so we can use it for our demonstration. Okay, and then I can give it to Vanessa. She can now see the task. I think we have to press the mouse button. Oh, it skipped our introduction slide. I don't know why, but it skipped. So her task is to look up when the University of Regensburg was founded. Okay, just mark the uh, date. Perfect. Then press F10. Okay, when next task? If you're ready, just the mouse button. with FC. Okay. <clears throat> oh, well, it seemed to have just changed the reorder while we have transferred it. So, 
can just skip it because we have done both tasks. Okay. Okay, that was our recording. And I will just give you a short and a brief view how the data looks right now. I think we can just switch position. Thank you. Okay. When we go to reanalyze, we can have a look at our participant, which we have right here. So this is the gaze track of an SSIs. Well, here we have a calibration. I will just skip this and go to the task. So this was the one which was for some reason skipped. And here you can see how we have worked in the browser. So as Kenneth has mentioned before, you can see here the circles or bubbles or how you would like to call it. These are with fixations, which are made by a participant. This is every time a participant is looking up something and getting information about certain stimuli presented to them. And also the lines you can see here is um, called a fix, uh, saccade. So this is the time when the eye moves around and no information is picked up. Okay, so this is basically how we raw data looks to us. If you want to do further analysis, Toby Prolip offers you a lot of different options. So for example, um, I'm not a big fan of it, but you can also use, for example, heat maps just to get maybe a first overview of how and what the, uh, in what the participant was interested. For a more in-depth analysis, I would personally um, recommend uh, using AOIs. So AOIs are areas of interest you can place, for example, if we go to the browser of our participants. So we can, for example, say, um, where is it? Here it is. So we can say, for example, this is the area we are most interested in and get some extra information about this special area. So we can see, for example, how often has our participant looked it up? Um, when has our participant reached it during um, with web search? How long was this uh, area fixated, which is also known as dwell time? So to get an overview over all the metrics, um, which were important in eye tracking, I can highly recommend Kenneth's book. Um, he has also in his description, um, which was shown in the beginning of our presentation, um, if you have finally done your analysis, you can also export your metrics, for example. This is also, here you have a lot of different options. My personal suggestion is always um, try to make sure what you really want to survey. So do not take too much metrics, just try to really identify the one which are relevant for us. So in our case, it would probably be VAOI fixation metrics mostly. So this is when she has arrived there, how long has Vanessa looked at um, the year of funding and so on. So in our case, these are metrics most important. You can export them then to some different files, for example, like this TSV files or Excel reports. You can then use them, for example, in SPSS or even better in R to do more in-depth analysis. But doing the whole analysis will probably be way too long for our workshop here. So if you have any questions regarding eye tracking or the laboratory, feel free to ask and I will try to answer as much of them as possible. So that's probably our presentation of a lab. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay, yes. Um, thank you for your presentation. I think this is really interesting. Our department also has a Toby system, but instead of a huge lab by like you, we only have one. <laughs> Um, one of the topics that I think um, Christian Wolf brought up was the idea of using eye tracking to study how software engineering could be a collaborative process. Um, each one of the eye trackers usually tracks one single person's eyes. And if you're doing something like pair programming with um, agile software development, how would you track something like that? Um. I haven't got all of your question because I just needed some headphones, but I oh, think sorry. you talked okay. about, no, everything's fine. Yeah. I think you talked about pair programming. Yes. How, um, how could you use eye tracking to study, say, the difference between pair programming and um, singular programming? Because with the Toby system, usually each tracker only tracks one single person's eyes at a time. We have some special software written by us so that you can really project uh -huh. the eye movements of the other programmer um, to, the, um, to the other one. So you can really stream the eye movements from one participant to another one. So both of them can see simultaneously what the other one is looking at. Okay, but you wrote this yourself. This is special software. It doesn't, it's not it's something that you can ju us, yeah. just buy from Toby. Bummer. It's, some, yeah, <laughs> it's custom made. Do you have a paper where you um, where you documented how this software works, or? I think we are currently working on one of them. Okay. So yeah, I'd be looking making. forward to reading that. Yes. So yes, as soon as it's finished, we will publish it. And yes, if you want to be informed, so just look it up maybe on Research Gate. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, you could do that's the tooling perspective not just having an experiment, but using the eye tracker as an additional tool. So one person looks at it and you see where he looks, you don't have to point, you don't even need to be in the same room, for example, or could need to be, and that could enhance uh, IDE functionality. But yeah. at the same time, I think your question was more directed at how to do an experiment where we learn about how pair programming actually works. And this is also a challenge for using the eye tracker, of course. Mm -hmm. But I like your idea about seeing where someone else is looking, because right now we can't do pair programming anyway because of Corona. Theoretically, you could have one person with the eye tracker uh, doing a review and the other person seeing where they're looking. So streaming opens up a pretty new world for eye tracking. It's not only in software engineering. So for example, when we opened the uh, laboratory, we just did some, um, we used some, I'm not sure who was a painter, but we used just some old artworks and just placed some participants in front of them and asked them to look it up and see, um, and just ask them how we look at the picture and both of them saw exactly what the other one was seeing. So it was more like just a demonstration, but it was also very interesting. It opens up for eye tracking a very new perspective, I would say. Mm -hmm. And especially in software engineering, as you mentioned with pair programming, I think this could be very interesting as from the one side where we really say, okay, I'm interested in how does it work? and also in a way where you use eye tracking more as a tool. Okay. Further questions? Yeah. I'm wondering about uh, um, regarding the current situation, COVID situation, um, about uh, eye tracking in online exams in software engineering or programming courses. Did you uh, work on that too? Unfortunately, not so. We spectrums are really here at the laboratory. We haven't done any online studies. 
I know there is a lot around. There are also some studies where webcams are modified to be used um, for eye tracking, but we are not really active in this topic. And well, we are still waiting for eye tracking to be to be to become a commodity. For example, in the past we had uh, um, eye trackers from SNI, that Berlin-based company, which was bought by Apple, I think, four years ago. Uh, this might be an indicator that it's not uh, long until not or that we'll see eye tracking technology in standard computers soon. Today, it's still more or less expensive. We know about these low cost eye trackers where which are only 100 euros or so, which broaden the base, but it's not uh, the case that everybody has eye tracking available. It's still very much a lab thing. So especially when you use it for something like programming, because you need, really need a very high accuracy and a low cost, yeah. we are more for, for example, usability or gaming, where you do not really need the accuracy to be so high. And if you really need very accurate eye trackers, then they are going to be rather expensive. Okay, thanks. Okay. You're welcome. This is a history that we uh, took money from a federal call and the investment for this laboratory is half a million of euro. So it's, it's not cheap and it's not done by a normal laboratory budget. <laughs> yes, I can tell, um, I, as I said, we only have one single Toby tracker for our department. So I'm very envious of your hardware, Jürgen. <laughs> so we can also talk up, about possible common steps we can we can make a phone call. Yeah, maybe a research collaboration. Let's see. But I also thought Elke's comment was very interesting because we're all dealing with the COVID situation now, not just with digital e-learning, but how do we give digital exams without getting back a hundred solutions that are identical? Um, I know this is a very sensitive topic as far as data privacy goes. I don't know how the other participants here, the tutorial see this. Do they well, have actually, any comments? I had the first online open book exam uh, two weeks ago and I was astonished. It was not in software engineering, but in legal technology. So it was uh, lawyers and people like that, but uh, the contents were, was about technology. And I was surprised how much text they produce in just 90 minutes. <laughs> I don't want to know how they did it, actually. But it's a challenge because we cannot, we can only do open book exams because we do not have the proctoring or whatever it's called uh, techniques. And maybe we even don't want to do it. Uh, so we just have to run it in a open book fashion. And that's a challenge. But theoretically, technically, when eye tracking technology becomes cheap enough that it's built in, say, like your webcam, it would technically be possible to check yeah. what people are doing. Because one of the big um, concerns I think they had at another university is how do you know everyone's not just sitting there with WhatsApp on their smartphones um, yeah. trading text um, components? So in this kind, for example, when it is an open book um, test, you can probably use it. So when they look it up and uh, just look for some information in their material, then you can also see how we switch and so on. But I think this is more something, a topic of all the legal aspects, privacy and so on. Yeah, when you come to think of the Google Glass, uh, prototype. Uh, it was discontinued, I think, uh, also for uh, data privacy reasons, because uh, people weren't accepted uh, wearing those glasses, which recognize who people look at and so on and so forth. 
So in our studies, we have already done studies and a few, uh, I think, Florian, four or five papers we have already done. And there are more, yeah. with students. Uh, we ask the students for the privacy regulation and we have to keep this aspect in mind. It's also a question of acceptance of technology. Of course. And so in Germany, normally it's good if you have some kind of form which is in the European data protection with DSGVO um, law and so I, that the participants agree and you can really use your data also for publication. But of course we do some anonymization so that it's really not clear who was a participant. So we know of course who was it, but it's not communicated in a publication where we have recruited them or what background each single participant has. And of course, uh, we opened the classroom last year, right? Yes, in 2019. Yeah, and then Corona came and now we cannot use it as it is designed because we cannot send 15 people in there right now. So the throughput is much reduced. But that'll change next year, hopefully. And so a lot of questions are not, not only pair programming and implementing, it's also the way from a UML diagram to source code. And I don't discuss the simple things, how to transform a state diagram to a source code, but this is also complicated if you have concurrency in the state machine. But if you have Uh, parallelity, you have activity diagrams, how, tra how to transfer the content, the information of the diagram in appropriate source code constructs. Yep. So this is uh, also a, 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 um, a zoo of questions of software engineering and how to analyze how an expert do it and how a novice do it and how to transfer the knowledge from, from expert to novice. So, no more questions? Okay. So, summing up, we are still working on our research agenda, but we are quite convinced that there is a lot of uh, things we can do. And we hope very much that soon we can use the lab in its, in its full potential, which we can't do right now for obvious reasons. It, it's even mobile, actually because we have large, uh, what do you call it, suitcases for carrying it around, but of course it's not easy. Yes, you can visit us in good times after Corona, it will happen. And uh, good times for Regensburg is spring to autumn. Yeah. Our city is called the northest city of Italy in this fine time of year. But now it's fog, it's, it's not good. <laughs> And if you have interests, uh, think about it. It, it, uh, it must not be spontaneous now, but you can think about it. You can phone to Christian and me, and we both could be research partners for you. And we, we can arrange some things together in empirical software engineering with eye tracking. We are networking persons, Christian and I, and we come together and make things with others. and. This is also inspiration in science. Okay, if there are no other questions, we, uh, Florian, do we have some things you will say or is it okay for you? No, I would just like all our participants for taking part in our uh, workshop today. I hope you have learned something about the eye tracking technology and the classroom project. And as Jürgen said, we would be happy if you would like to work with us. Yes. So Thank. keep healthy in these times and have a good conference. Again.
Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.